and I'm, I'm Vivian and I have a introduction slide. Um, so about me, I did my undergrad at Columbia. I was a computer science major with like, with a minor in mechanical engineering. I actually didn't do the last class, so I didn't fully get the minor, but um, I kind of did both. And I've worked at several different places. I've worked at uh, NASA's JPL, Disney Research, Conservation X Lab, which is a startup, uh, the San Diego Zoo Global, and then Walt Disney Imagineering. Um, and these are a combination of internships. And I took a gap year between my undergrad and my grad school. So I also interned during that time. And now I'm at the Robotics Institute, which is one of the departments under computer science at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, so, and the actual lab I'm working with is the Future Interfaces Group, which is under the Human Computer Interaction Institute, which is another department. Um, not super important, but basically, just of it is, I'm a researcher, I'm a PhD student, and I'm currently working in this lab. Uh, I actually gave a talk on robotics research during the last Code Labs uh, last year. And I'm sure that's in the archive somewhere if anyone's interested in more in depth about robotics research itself. But this lab is this talk is going to be a little bit more of the, the soft stuff. Now that I've been in a PhD program for a year, uh, I just finished my first year. I thought that now I kind of have a better idea of why it is people come to grad school since I've met so many PhD other PhD students. And I wanted this to be an opportunity to kind of like shed light on this path that maybe isn't talked about as much in undergrad for computer science majors specifically. Um, so why do a PhD? That's what we're going to be starting out with. Um, I actually, I thought I could see my notes, but that's fine. I, I don't know where my notes are for right now. Um, but uh, just to preface, this whole talk is going to be focused on computer science PhDs, and that's encompassing a whole range of subjects. Maybe you could call it like computer related PhDs at large because I think this talk will also help with like computer engineering or maybe that kind of stuff. But definitely a PhD in like the humanities or English or something is going to be very different from a computer science PhD. So this talk is not helpful with those kind of majors. Um, everything I talk about is very specific to kind of CS related PhDs. And also another thing to note is that um, these are all my opinions. There is no cut and paste path for a PhD student or why to get a PhD. Um, I'm just hoping that what I talk about will help someone at least a little bit. So yeah, we're starting with why to get a PhD. Uh, this is the super cool robe that CMU PhD students get, but that's not why you should do a PhD. Uh, I think that a lot of times when we talk about the areas that we can go into after undergrad, we break them into three categories, which is university, industry or sorry academia industry and government and those are kind of like the, the three areas that people go into of course there's also you know startups which is underneath industry maybe and you know nonprofits which can also maybe be slotted under industry but the, i i consider these the general categories of where people can end up job wise so academia industry and government and there's this kind of commonly held misconception that if you're getting a PhD, you're going into academia and that for industry and for government, you're going to get like a bachelor's, maybe even a master's, but people tend to think that like a PhD slots you into the academic side. And that just really isn't true. Um, that being said, of course, if you do want to be a professor, 99% of the time you will need a PhD. So I won't be talking about that during my talk because that's a pretty actual straightforward path. If you want to be a professor, you should get a PhD. Um, but I'm actually going to be focusing on talking about why you would need a PhD in either industry or uh, the government position that you could possibly get after graduation. So here are some common misconceptions about a PhD. Uh, a lot of people think that a PhD traps you into a narrow, narrow area of expertise. Um, that you have to have this one super pinpoint focus and you are the expert of that. And yes, that does become true for some people, but that's not a requirement of a PhD. You don't have to get pigeonholed into one very specific thing. Um, another misconception is that a PhD is for people who like really know what they're doing or know what they want to do. Um, a lot of people are like, 
I can't go to grad school because I don't know what I want to do later in life. And that's not necessarily true. I mean, you should, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about things you do need to know for a PhD, but you don't need to be like, I'm going to be a computer, computer vision scientist working on self-driving cars. You don't need to know this in order to do a PhD. Um, other people say PhD is for people who aren't interested in pushing products to market. This is, this goes along with that misconception that in industry, you don't need a PhD and industry is often the people who bring products to market. If you think about like, you know, Facebook, Apple, Google, that's the, the FANG companies that I had up on that list. Um, they all are bringing products to market, whether that be apps or hardware devices. Um, and a lot of people think that like, okay, if that's an industry, then that isn't something that PhDs do. And that's also another common misconception. PhDs work on all of these products all of the time. Um, again, something that I will cover later. Uh, another misconception is a PhD isn't useful for CS majors. Um, this kind of ties into the next, the last point, which is that it doesn't have a much better income. A lot of people think that like, because the job market for CS undergrads is so great, which is a really good thing for all of us, um, that getting a PhD doesn't really enhance your job prospects or income prospects much more. That's actually quite untrue. A lot of times in industry, maybe not in government because you know the salaries in government are a little bit steadfast, but in industry, uh, PhDs can actually earn far more than uh, under or than just bachelor holders. I wanted to find a good statistic for that, but after a lot of googling, there's no like actual median income comparison that I could find that was like a good comparison, often because computer science is kind of thrown into the other engineering majors, which this is why this is a more of a CS specific talk. Other engineering majors vary wildly for what a PhD is or isn't for. Um, but from my personal experience of meeting lots of PhDs and current doctors, uh, it actually does open up better job prospects, higher job prospects and like a larger income ceiling at the very least. Um, so yeah, those are some of the common misconceptions of a PhD. So what is a PhD actually for? A PhD is for learning how to do research. And I know that sounds pretty self-explanatory, sure, but that is what it's for. It's not for becoming a narrow expert. It's not for, uh, for the, some of the things I said, it's not for people who like really know what they wanna work on and they're getting a PhD just to work on that thing. It's for learning how to do research. And research is, according to the dictionary, the systematic investigation into and study of materials and sources in order to establish facts and reach new conclusions. Um, there's this really ugly, you know, word bubble that I found that I thought was kind of funny. So I put that on the right. But basically what all these fancy words and pictures mean is that researching is about discovering new stuff. Uh, and, you know, research and new stuff, like there's so many different things that are considered new stuff. That's new products, new ideas, um, and you're learning how to get into this process. So I wanted to show a couple of examples of companies that we've probably all heard of and some of the new stuff, AKA research that they've done that a lot of PhDs are involved in, or sorry, when I say PhD, I mean people who have gotten PhD and are in the industry now, for specifically for now. But um, so I'm gonna play this video. The audio is not that important, so I, I don't think the audio will work. But this is Suntronics from Disney Research, a project led by. So that's one example of a project that was at Disney. It's actually in the parks now at the new Avengers campus, which opened up uh, in, in uh, California, I believe that park. And so I didn't work on this project or anything, but I worked with the people who worked on this project. And 
they all had PhDs. Uh, everyone leading this project was a doctor and um, an example of industry research that was pushed to market in that it is now reaching the users. People are being are able to see it. It's not just a paper that's stashed away in an archive somewhere. Um, another example of research at a company we all know is the AI for Good department at Microsoft. I'm only going to play this video for a little bit, but oh wait, it's true. like never before. Our world is changing. Faced with some of our most critical challenges, human ingenuity triumphs. Today, the Microsoft AI for Good initiative enables a person with an idea to accelerate it, to give it scale, to create change for the better. Microsoft AI will help our work by empowering people to take action. Through, through AI for Earth, photos can now help save a species. With AI for accessibility, the visual world becomes an audible experience. Sanitary and peanut butter. And with AI for humanitarian action, first responders can target their efforts faster than ever before. It feels humbling to know that I'm actually helping another human being. Today, we are empowering others to forge new paths, to fight famine before crisis strikes, and protect ecosystems by identifying forests down to a single tree. We have the forest that we have today. We can't change that. What we can change is the future. Microsoft AI is fueling some of the most passionate and creative people on our planet with the help of citizen scientists to make change, once thought impossible, real. AI will know and understand and model based on the child interaction. AI unleashes new possibilities to impact our world. And together, we're not just dreaming it, we're doing it. So like I said, um, I don't know if that audio came through, but even just from the video, you can see lots of example of using computer vision algorithms to detect, I don't know, patterns of a zebra to be able to identify wild zebras and track their movement through the savannas. Um, that's one thing that AI for Earth does. It also highlighted AI for accessibility, which is computer vision applications that can read labels and tell you what certain products you're holding in your hand are. Um, and then the last one was AI for community and humanitarian action. I just realized they're all computer vision, but I, they also have other stuff. But that one was a computer vision algorithm to identify scenes in a, like an earthquake disaster and where there might be potential, you know, people who are trapped or something. Um, and all of these are, you know, AI is a huge buzzword right now. It's also very huge in all research across all CS disciplines. And so this is a software based example of a new product that is brought to market in the sense that it is now being used by real people. And it's something that researchers, most of which have PhDs, do work on. Um, and oh, no. can, oh, our world. And then the final example I have, and this one I'm also not going to or this one I'm not going to play all the way through, but this is the Mars helicopter, which was recently uh, deployed by NASA JPL. And so this is not the actual video, but this is actually a video of uh, just like a simulated version of the Mars helicopter. So this is the Mars helicopter. Um, that's a Mars rover, curiosity. Um, yeah, you can get the gist of it from this, but again, when I was working at JPL, I didn't work on this project, but I worked adjacent to the team that did work on this project. And, um, 
yes, this is just a simulation, but NASA, when they do simulations, they're like basically the same as the real life because they have to be if you're working with something in space that you aren't able to fix if it goes wrong. So why did I show you all of these projects from various well-known companies? Uh, these are all projects that people who do industry research and have PhDs work on. And you might be thinking like, oh, you know, you can work on these projects with just a bachelor's or just a master's. And you are completely correct. Uh, plenty, JPL actually works under a third, third, third structure where they have a third undergrad, sorry, a third bachelor's, a third master's, and a third PhDs. And that's kind of the makeup of all of JPL. Um, and that's the structure that they work under. Similar to Dizzy Research, there's plenty of workers there who work on the development of these projects that only have bachelors or only have masters. And also with Microsoft, uh, Microsoft AI for, for good is a research department. Microsoft itself, of course, employs tons and tons and tons of bachelors. But Microsoft AI for good, um, they also have some bachelors and some masters and some PhDs. So why would you want to get a PhD if all you care about is working on these like really exciting projects? Uh, the difference is that these projects are led by doctoral researchers. So, um, for example, at JPL, when I was interning, I was just doing an internship, but my team was two PhD holders and that one of them was my boss. We had one master's holder who was working in the lab and we had one, two bachelor's holders working in the lab. And it was very clear that the PhD holders, the doctoral researchers were the ones calling the shots on what kind of mechanisms we would try on our test bed. We were making a Mars test bed. Um, they, were, they were the ones calling the shot on like what mechanisms were worth testing out, what ideas were worth killing because they just weren't going to produce any effective results. Um, they were the ones kind of researching new design ideas and it was the bachelor's and master's holders that were kind of implementing what they were talking about. And it's still a really awesome time. It's still a really awesome job being able to implement such interesting research on these kind of new stuff. As I said, research is new stuff. But the, the difference with being a PhD holder is that you get to be the one calling the shots and the one who's at the forefront of the project and the one who's like leading a team to accomplish this, these new goals, these awesome projects. Um, so yeah, so what does learning how to do research mean, which is what you get out of doing a PhD? Uh, basically, research, as I said, is new stuff. And learning how to do new stuff isn't as cut and isn't as straightforward as maybe the classes you would be able to take in your bachelor's. Like a bachelor's gives a really great foundation for a lot of computer science concepts. You get, you know, your uh, computational logic classes done. You get your linear algebra and statistics classes done. You get basic programming in like some low level languages some high level languages. Some schools have you learn to make compilers, you know, you get a really good overview of what's out there, but you're learning things that have been done already, if that makes sense. I mean, textbooks are full of content that's been, you know, published, verified, used, and that's what you're learning in those classes. So a PhD really opens up a path for you to learn how to learn new things and how to do new things. And I wrote several things that I think learn what learning how to do research means. So, you know, it's identifying important issues to solve, uh, understanding which solutions are viable, figure out what products are or aren't worth pursuing. Um, that's something I'll touch on in a bit, but uh, learning how to start projects. And that's the really important thing, because like I said, for those research projects that I showed the videos for, um, it was the doctoral researchers that were like kind of ideating that and designing that and starting off with like a rough prototype or I mean having someone implement a rough prototype or implementing it themselves and iterating on that. And then as, I get as it gets closer and closer and closer to being a finished product, that's when usually it's given over to uh, teams that aren't research based in order to make those final like development pushes, making sure it can be manufactured for distribution, making sure that like it's not going to just malfunction or short or something and making it very robust. And that's no longer going to be research. That's kind of the last the last stages of a project before it becomes real. Um, so that's why I emphasize the starting the project is what a lot of doctoral learning to do research is. Uh, and then being able to debug never before seen problems. Um, that's 
pretty obvious if you're working on new stuff that when you come into an issue with whatever system you're building or coding, uh, you can't just stack overflow like why isn't it working because no one's done it before you don't really know why it's working, you can get kind of close to the answer by looking at previous literature or previous research but there's not going to be a straightforward like this is how you solve this bug just like maybe you can find that for your homeworks in your classes but you can't for research and finally the one I, the point that i highlighted is the sell the world on your ideas um i know that sounds really grand uh there's also like kind of a smaller meaning to that which is that you need to be able to you know get grant money and get funding for your ideas and they're new so learning how to do research a lot of a part of a phd is applying for those grants and like justifying your idea why it's worth making what problem are you solving uh like why is it going to work and just kind of selling people on your new ideas um so one thing that i actually compare research to is hackathons or startups which a lot of people don't expect because there's that kind of phd sitting in a cubicle 40 hours a day or sorry not like a like 100 hours a week it's all musty and dusty and there's stacks of textbooks like that's kind of the image of a phd that comes across in movies i personally as someone who's done a lot of hackathons that's actually how i was introduced to code day was through hackathons um i think that that's actually a lot more similar to research because with hackathons you're not trying to redo an app the point of hackathons is to have an idea and just spend 40 hours straight bringing it to life. And it's not, it's going to be a minimum MVP, minimum viable product. It's not going to like be something you can sell immediately, but it's an idea that you bring to life to verify if it's worth pursuing. And, you know, then you compete with it. And I, I personally love that. Um, and startups, I mean, startups are just an extension of hackathons, right? If you have this product, you have this idea in your head, it's new, it's never been done. So you go and make it and you try to make it a company and you try to make it big. And startups are, of course, a step above hackathons in that your product has to be actually viable to be manufactured and distributed. It has to be more robust. Um, if you're gonna get investors, if you're gonna get, I don't know, crowdfunding, you need something robust. And research is in a, a similar direction where it's you're creating that robustness, you're creating that, but from a, from a new seed of idea, you're creating a product that can be sold to people. It's just that you don't usually do the actual selling to market yourself. That's what startups have that research doesn't. Um, but I really think that if you like hackathon culture, if you like startup culture, if you like taking your idea uh, and just making it real and like either publishing it out as a paper or putting it out there in the world, like that's what research is. So to recap, a PhD may be for you if you want to call your own shots as i said many most 95 percent of research projects are led by doctoral researchers so if you want to have that kind of autonomy you want to you probably want a phd um you want to be working on the newest technology out there like i said you can be doing that as a bachelor's or master's but you have a much higher chance of doing that as a phd and you're interested in impact because when you're creating this kind of new stuff People are interested. People are really excited. I don't know if any of you have seen those wrote, those projects that I showed you before, that I the videos that I showed. I don't know if any of you have seen those before, but they are exciting things that people have been talking about. Stuntronics, which is a stunt double robot, is on so many major news outlets, and like it's creating an an experience at Disneyland that is unsafe for humans to be doing. But they're launching this robot sixty feet in the air every day and making it do flips and stuff, and it's if the guests are enjoying it. I don't know if that's the type of impact you're looking for, but it is a type of impact. And a PhD opens up so many different avenues to impact. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about why you might want a PhD. Uh, feel free to, if you if anyone has any questions, you can drop it in the Q&A or raise your hand. Uh, you can also wait till the end and I'll have a little bit of time for questions. Um, but now the second section of the talk is how. Like, how does a PhD work? How to get a PhD? Um, it's, again, not a cut, cut and paste path to like getting into a PhD program and getting a PhD. But this is kind of some of my insights. I try to keep them general so that hopefully I can't get called out for like giving misinformation. Um, so how to get a PhD. 
first thing that you should note if you're getting a PhD is some of the sacrifices. So you have around, PhDs are always gonna take around five plus years. Some people do it in four. On a very, very, very rare occasion, I've heard of one or two people doing it in three. But most of the time you're gonna be doing five plus years. Some schools say six. Uh, I would say like five to seven is a good ballpark for how long a PhD will take. And during this time, you're working off a stipend. Um, I'm not sure if everyone knows this, but as a PhD student, your tuition is paid for. So you take classes as part of a PhD and you also get a stipend for living. Um, stipends from what I've seen from the various schools that I applied to and talked to, uh, they seem to be generally the same per school for CS PhDs specifically. Um, and CS PhDs usually get a higher stipend than most of the other departments. But um, it's based on your advisor, it's based on your school, it's based on your department, how much you actually do get. It, it just, as a rule, will be less than you would make if you just went to industry straight away for those five years. Uh, because obviously if you're working off a stipend, like you're not making a six figure salary. So that's a definite sacrifice. Um, that's one reason why I took a gap year between my undergrad and my grad is so that I could work and save up money. And that's been really helpful, I think, for, for me personally. Um, some people will do three to five years of a, of a gap period before doing a PhD. And that's totally normal too. Uh, my class of PhDs, we have people as old as uh, I think like fifth in their forties, they have two kids. And then like the youngest we have is maybe 20 years old. Um, so it's a huge range for PhDs. It's not weird to start at any point. Uh, so especially considering that there are sacrifices you have to make. There's also, it'll take five plus years of your time and you know, time, time is valuable. So that's something you have to think about because you will have to prepare for it taking mentally and mentally prepare for it to take maybe like six years. You can tell yourself you wanna do it in four, but if you think you're gonna do it in four and you go longer, that's gonna be rough. Um, it's a heavy workload. That's definitely true. Uh, it's basically how I tell my friends that what my life is like is you only really take two classes per semester for most PhD programs that I've heard of. And they're gonna to be tough classes. They're gonna be harder than the classes you took in undergrad probably. Um, but on top of that, you're gonna have a 40 hour work week. If you're lucky, most people would work 60 hours, I would say. So it's like you're doing like a 40 to 60 hour work week, maybe to 80, depends on your lab. And on top of that, you have homework. So that definitely makes it pretty difficult. I mean, I feel like I still have time for a social life on top, uh, like with that, but I, I have been working harder for this past year than I've probably ever worked before, which I think is, great for me because you know sometimes I'm, I was lazy in undergrad I didn't work as hard maybe. and then finally it can be difficult on mental and physical health that's just directly due to the workload um, you got to make sure you find a lab that can have the right balance for you some labs are super intense and everyone's going to be working in 100 hour work weeks and if that's what you're looking for like that's awesome but some labs are also going to be uh, you know they'll actually have a good work-life balance and people will like they'll make you get off work at 6 p.m. Um, and that's for some people as well. So these are all individual decisions, but they are general things that come along with a PhD uh, that you should be prepared for basically. But now a little bit more about what you need. So first, what you need in a PhD. And I think there's really three things you need for to kind of fulfill the definition of a PhD, let's say. The first one is your field. Um, so sorry, this is such an ugly slide. I just screenshotted this from the Wikipedia. But basically, I am I go to CMU and I'm under the School of Computer Science. Like I said, I'm in the Robotics Institute. So you'll see like fifth from the bottom, there's a PhD in robotics. That's what I'm getting. But uh, there's like a lot of doctoral programs underneath the SES. These are all the doctoral programs underneath my school. Some of them are like, a little confusing they're like dual degrees i'm not entirely sure what what those are but you can see basically the different fields in this list you have like human computer interaction which is uh well human that's kind of what i'm working on now but it's about the the interaction of human humans and technology not necessarily in robot form there is also human robot interaction there's robotics there's societal computing which is like computing on a global scale 
um, and like maybe more networksy stuff. There's machine learning as its own department at my school. So you can get a PhD in machine learning if that's something like you're really interested in focusing on that field of machine learning. Uh, there's the language and technology, it's language and information technologies field. So that's kind of like NLP, uh, natural language processing, or that's anything to do with language and technology. Um, this list is not something you need to be familiar with. This is very specific to Carnegie Mellon University. And I personally, we have more departments than I would say a lot of, a lot of schools and ours are very, um, so we have like machine learning, robotics, human computer action, language technology institute, and then the computer science department, which is kind of like the other stuff. Depending on where you're interested in going, uh, which is something I'll discuss later, but depending on that, uh, you know, different schools have different fields. Some of them are broader, like some of them might, might just be like robotics, artificial intelligence, other. Pretty sure that's like kind of what Stanford has basically. Um, but it's good to have a general idea of the broad field you want to work in. So for me, that field is robotics. I'm really interested in robotics. And within robotics, there's like literally like 40 different types of research. That was, like I said, my the talk I gave last year um, about the different types of robotics research. But that's just like a large field that I'm interested in. The second thing is a focus. I didn't really have anything to put on the slide, so I have this. But a focus within your field is kind of how would I would I would put it is basically the skills that you're interested in having. So within robotics, you can be someone that just like makes makes the robots. That would be more hardware stuff. So maybe you're interested in embedded systems or you're interested in fabrication and machining. It doesn't have to be super specific, but just like, are you interested in the hardware maybe? Or for example, my focus in robotics is I'm really interested in computer vision and like sensors which is again, a super broad thing, but it's just narrower. It's a narrower focus in the scope of my field. So like robots need computer vision for self-driving cars is technically a robot. It's a hardware piece that uses computer vision to navigate um, or like sensors. I consider computer vision and sensors. I call it computer perception because you don't need just cameras for robots to be able to sense the world around them. They can also use, you know, uh, like a thermal sensor to know how hot it is outside and whether it's raining or that's not what thermal sensors do, but or like a photo cell resistor to be able to tell how light it is outside and if it's to like turn on its headlights. Um, these are all like perceiving the world in different ways. And I'm interested in how computers perceive the world. So that's why I'm interested in computer perception. Um, other examples of focus is like, I would actually consider machine learning a focus. I know in the last slide, it was on the last slide as a field, and that's because, I, uh, like I said, CMU has a whole department dedicated to it. But at many other schools, it would more be that artificial intelligence is like the big field, and then machine learning is kind of a subset of that, and that's like a focus, or just reinforcement learning, or just robot learning. Um, but yeah, you don't have to be pigeonholed. You don't have to be like, I only do machine learning on audio data sets. That's not what I mean by focus. You don't have to be that specific, but it's nice to know kind of the skill set you want to require in a PhD. Because, like for example, I'm taking a lot of vision vision classes. And finally, name. I put a question mark because it's not necessarily needed. That was meant. That just means it's optional. But basically, the name of some professors that you think have really cool work that you'd like to work with. Um, so every school has you know their professors doing a bunch of different research, and there's so much cool research going on. It's good to know which professors have research you're interested in. And you can just figure this out by reading Wikipedia pages or reading their website or reading their papers, which is not usually necessary because that's a lot of work, but just like reading stuff that they've put out in their recent projects. Um, it's not always necessary because like, for example, at CMU or Stanford, your first year, actually, they give you time to choose your advisor. Um, but at some schools, you have to apply to a specific lab so you have to like if you're applying to columbia you have to apply to a professor you don't apply to the department so it's good to know names of people you're interested in and finally this is my last section but what you need before a phd and this is kind of like i said general guidelines that'll help you get into a phd program so first is experience it's always going to be experience um this experience is a little different than general computer science experience I would say that if you're interested in 
doing a PhD, you should get research experience, which you can't find with as much with SWE internships. Um, research experience would be stuff like being an undergraduate researcher at a at your at a lab at your university, or even doing side projects and hackathons. I consider pretty good experience. I have those on my resume, um, and I'm really proud of those projects. Or applying to industry research internships. They're often a little hard to get because they're usually reserved more for grad students, but they still have a couple spots at every company for undergraduate researchers. Um, and so that you can do industry research. And then the another thing you can do is REU, REUs, which are research experience for undergraduates. Generally, almost every university, every big university is gonna have REUs or just like summer research opportunities. So those are kind of like internships. You get paid a little bit, not as much as a sweet internship, um, but that would be uh, enable you to go outside of your own school and do research at other schools. Um, but definitely the easiest to get in my opinion is just undergrad research at your own school. A lot of times because they don't pay you. So labs will let you do research for them because it's free labor for them, um, but depends on your school. Second is relationships. And I'm not talking about nepotism to get into schools. I'm talking about for recommendation letters. Recommendation letters are huge in, uh, I guess, the graduate school experience. Uh, therefore, you need it for every fellowship, every scholarship, and definitely to get into grad school. So this can be, recommendation letters can come from anyone who knows you well. Uh, for example, when I applied, I used one from the professor that I did undergraduate research with, I did one from the professor that I TA'd for. So I didn't even take his class actually, I just TA'd for him. But because I interacted with him so closely from TAing, he wrote me a recommendation letter. And a third one was from my boss from an internship, actually Disney Research. So um, he, you know, he mentored me for a summer. So I had him write it. So relationship with professors of all types, whether you TA for them, take their class or do research with them. And then just like, industry researchers if you end up doing an industry research position or just like anyone you can speak to your skills that you've worked with. Third is story. Um, I put an asterisk here because on applications you're gonna have to write like why you want to do a PhD but it it doesn't wrote it doesn't mean that you have to do that. So um, like I wrote about doing conservation technology and that is something that I am really interested in but it's not something that I'm doing right now. And it's not something I probably will do for my PhD. I'm hoping to do it after I graduate, but for, like, it's just something that I am genuinely interested in that I wrote about because it, I could write about it since I was passionate about it. So if you have some area of technology or some, or even just like a singular project that you're really interested in and being able to have true passion for it. Like, I know that's cheesy, but they always say, you know, admissions officers can see the passion. And I, I think that's true. And then finally, good grades is another asterisk, because the thing is, if you have great experience and great relationships, uh, your grades don't matter as much. But if you do not, then you should general rule, try to keep above a 3.5. Um, if you have lower than that, that's also fine. If again, you have good relationships, experience and story. So this is actually the order of importance, in my opinion. Um, but a general rule of thumb is to try to keep your GPA above a 3.5. I had like barely a 3.5 and I like I ended up here, so it's pretty good. Um, if you can try to do above a 3.7, that's like the actual, like then you then they don't care. Like above 3.7, they don't care. Above, like between 3.5, 3.7. If you have like fine experience relationships, then that's fine. Below 3.5, you better have like good experience relationships and story. Um, and then these are just slides that I stole from my talk last year, actually. So I'm just going to speed through them because there's, there's, there's only four slides, but basically how to get started. I think there's three pillars, which is learn, ideate, and fiddle. Um, and I put this in my robotics talk too, because I think they're good. I actually forgot to change the words on learn. Um, but basically, if you're interested in professors or research or something, try skimming the abstracts of papers or watching videos from conferences like like a robotics paper conference or a human computer interaction paper conferences if you want you can always ask 
me, I guess. I think I'll give you my email at the end and I can let you know, like if you have a specific interest or anything, I can point you to resources. Um, but just learning uh, things in the field that interest you so you can create that story and have those kind of goals. Ideating, this pillar is still the same. It's like, think about what you wanna build, how to build it and why you're building it. Um, you don't have to actually build it, but like the idea itself, like what do you want to do it? How do you do it? And like, why, why this? Um, that's a lot of research and having that kind of process in your mind already is like a really good way to start, in my opinion. And then the most important to me is the fiddling. So like I said, hackathons, school research, side project, internships, REUs, SERFs, SERFs is also summer undergraduate research fellowship. Um, those are out in many colleges too. Like being able to have that experience, that is the best way to get into grad school and also just know if you wanna to go to grad school. Um, yeah, and that's it for my talk. This is also just robot stuff because I love robots. Um, but my, you can find me at VHN on everything. That's my you know, Twitter, uh, GitHub, dev post, LinkedIn is VHN. And then that's my CMU email. If any of you have any questions and want to email me, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, and that's it for my talk. If anyone has any questions, please let me know. So there's no questions, that's okay too. Um, I guess I'll hand it back to Alpert. I don't know if you are there. 